issues, but to also have contemporary witnesses stand here and share their experiences with us. As our first contemporary witness, so to speak, I welcome Mr. Whitney Harris. As a young lawyer of 33 years, he came to Nuremberg in 45 to be within, within the team of Robert H. Jackson to prosecute the Nazi war criminals in the Schulgerichtssaal 600 in the courthouse of Nuremberg. After the trial in 1954, Mr. Harris published his experiences as a book which is called Tyranny on Trial, which is a superb summary of the evidence presented at Nuremberg. As a matter of fact, let me just mention this here now for all the German-speaking audience. It has now been possible to translate the book into German and it's now available since Tuesday. It was a specific pleasure for me to have this copy of Tyranny on Trial in German, which is called Tyrannen vor Gericht, to hand this to the author in the Schulgerichtssaal in Nuremberg on last Tuesday. I don't want to lose now more words because Whitney Harris is a much more interesting person to listen to than myself. Mr. Harris, Whitney, please deliver your address.
and will deliver them to their accusers in order that justice may be done. On May 8, 1945, President Harry Truman appointed Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson as the United States Chief of Counsel charged with obtaining the agreement of the Allies to a trial of the major Axis war criminals before an international <coughs> military tribunal. Jackson succeeded in persuading the British to agree to the proposed trial, and on June 26, 1945, representatives of the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union met in London for the purpose of drafting an agreement for the trial of the Axis war leaders. I served as a line officer in the United States Navy throughout World War II. Toward the end of the war, the Navy assigned me to active duty with the Office of Strategic Services a top secret espionage service. OSS has sent me to London in charge of the investigation of war crimes in the European theater. I was in London on this mission when representatives of the Allied powers convened to negotiate an agreement for the trial of the major Axis war criminals. From time to time, I was able to provide the American negotiators with incriminating Nazi documents. Ultimately, I was invited to join the prosecution staff and with the consent of OSS moved to Nuremberg in August 1945 with the first contingent of American prosecutors. The principal repressive agency of the Nazi regime was the Reich Main Security Office or RSHA. Both intelligence and special police agencies were combined in this office. Since I had acquired some knowledge of Nazi intelligence uh, system while serving at OSS, I was assigned a case against the Gestapo and SD, two organizations within the RSHA, and against the chief of that office, the defendant, Ernst Kaltenberg, who had succeeded Reinhard Heydrich in that position in January 30, 1943, after Heydrich's assassination in Czechoslovakia. The major crime against humanity charged against the Nuremberg defendants was the genocidal extermination of Jews, gypsies, and other unwanted minority groups. This crime was primarily the responsibility of the Gestapo and SD within the government and of the SS within the party. Thus, this part of the case fell primarily into my hands. Shortly before the trial <coughs> began, I learned that the British had under interrogation in London Otto Ullen, the head of Op 3 of the RSHA, which dealt with matters of intelligence within Germany. I asked that the British send Ollendorf to Nuremberg so that I might interrogate him on the organization of the RSHA, of which my defendant Kosselbrunner was the chief. The British did so, and I began my interrogation of Ollendorf by asking him about his activities during the war. He said that except for the year 1941, he had served as the chief of Op 3 of the RSHA. Naturally, I asked him what he had done during that year. When he replied that in 1941, he had been in command of Einsatzgruppe D. I immediately recalled the Becker letter, uh, and I was inspired to ask, well, Ollendorf, how many men, women, and children did your group kill uh, during that year? And he answered, 90,000. That broke the case on the extermination program of the Einsatzgruppen in the Eastern Territories. 
And we were able to establish through the testimony of Oldor and others that approximately two million persons, many Jews, have been murdered by these units of the RSHA. It was the initial proof of the Holocaust. Orendorf testified that he knew of Becker and Ralph and that the Becker letter was genuine. He added that the gas vans were of various sizes, large enough to kill from 15 to 25 victims at one time. Perhaps the most dramatic episode in the entire trial was the interchange between the Soviet judge and the attorney for Otto <coughs> The Soviet member of the tribunal, General Mikhochenko, asked the following questions of Olenkov. Question. In your testimony, you testified that the Einsatz groups had the object of annihilating Jews and commissars. Is that correct? Answer, yes. <coughs> Question, and in what category did you consider the children? For what reason were the children massacred? Answer, the order was that the Jewish population should be totally exterminated. Question, including children? Answer, yes. Were all the Jewish children murdered? Answer, yes. Here you have the essential elements of the genocide. The purpose of sending Jews to concentration camps was not to punish them for crimes they had allegedly committed but for the monstrous purpose of exterminating the Jewish race. Any contention that these murders were carried out by subterfuge and without force was belied by the account of a mass murder witnessed by Hermann Grady, the German manager and engineer in charge of the branch office of the Solinger firm in the Ukraine from September 41 until January 1944. Gravy's interest in the mass executions arose from the fact that in addition to Poles, Germans, and Ukrainians, he employed Jews on the various construction projects under his supervision. He described a mass execution which he witnessed on October 5, 1943, at Dubno, Ukraine. He said, I drove to the site, accompanied by my foreman, and saw near it great mounds, great mounds of earth about 50 meters long and 2 meters high. Several trucks stood in front of the mounds. Armed Ukrainian militia drove the people off the trucks under the supervision of an SS man. The militiamen acted as guards on the trucks and drove them in and from the pit. All these people had the regulation yellow patches on their front and back of their clothes and thus could be recognized as Jews. My foreman and I went directly to the pits. Nobody bothered us. Now I heard rifle shots in quick succession from behind one of the earth mountains. The people who had got off the trucks, men, women, and children of all ages, had one dress upon the orders of an SS man who carried a rifle and dog whip. They had to put down their clothes in fixed places, sorted according to shoes, top clothing, and underclothing. I saw heaps of shoes, piles of other linen clothing. Without screaming or weeping, these people undressed, stood around in family groups, kissed each other, said farewell, and waited for a sign from another SS man who stood near the pit, also with a whip in his hand. 
During the 15 minutes that I stood nearby, I heard no complaint or plea for mercy. I watched the family of about seven persons, a man and a woman, both about 50, with some children of about 1, 8, and 10, and two grown-up dogs of about 20 and 24. An old woman with snow white hair was holding the one-year-old in her arms and singing to it and tickling it. The child was cooing in delight. The couple was looking on with tears in their eyes. The father was holding the hand of a boy about ten years old and speaking to him softly. The boy was fighting his tears. The father pointed to the sky, stroked his head, and seemed to explain something to him. At that moment, the SS man at the pit shouted to his comrade. The latter counted off about twenty persons and instructed them to go behind the earth. <coughs> Among them was the family which I have mentioned. I well remember a girl, slim with black hair, who as she passed close to me, pointed to herself and said, 23. I walked around the mound and found myself confronted by a tremendous grave. People were closely wedged together and were lying on top of each other so that only their heads were visible. The pit was about two-thirds full. I estimated it already contained about a thousand people. I looked for the man who did the shooting. He was an SS man who sat at the edge of the narrow end of his pit, his feet dangling into the pit. He had a Tommy gun on his knees and was smoking a cigarette. The victims went down some steps which had been cut into the clay wall of the pit and clambered over the bodies of the people lying there to the place to which the SS man directed them. They lay down in front of the dead of Richard people. Then I heard a series of shots. I looked into the pit and saw that the bodies were twitching with the heads lying motionless on top of the bodies which lay before them. I left with my foreman and drove in my car back to do In my book, Tyranny on Trial, a, tire, a diagram is displayed containing a report by Stoller, the chief of Einsatz Group A, showing the number of Jews exterminated in the Baltic states, each number encased in a diagram of a coffin. The report stated that in the first four months of operations, Einsatz Group A had murdered 135,000 communists and Jews. Estonia was shown as already Juden Frei, free of Jews. An especially dramatic event of the trial was a cross-examination of Herman Goering by Justice Jackson. Goering had assumed the role of leader of the defendants. He occupied the first seat in the dock. It was, therefore, of great interest to the press when Goering was cross-examined by Justice Jackson. I was Jackson's assistant in this dramatic moment of the trial and sat beside him at the prosecutor's podium. Among the issues we raised was Goering's activity in the terrible program, program of November 9, 1938, which has come to be known as Kresselnacht, the Night of Shattered Glass. This was a Nazi reaction to the murder of a secretary in the German embassy in Paris by a German Jew named Grinspan. During the night, Jewish stores were destroyed throughout Germany. Thousands of Jews were taken into custody and sent to concentration camps. Some were killed. Goering met with Hitler and Goebbels to consider further repressive measures. Goering proposed imposing a fine of one billion Reichsmarks upon the Jews whose property had been destroyed so that all insurance benefits 
to which they might be entitled would instead be paid to the state. At a meeting in the Reich Air Ministry, Gary declared that Jews should be forced out of the economy. We must agree on a clear action, he said, that will be profitable to the state. And he closed the meeting with these prophetic words. I'd like to state again that I would not like to be a Jew in Germany if in the near future the German right should come into conflict with foreign powers. It goes without saying that we in Germany should first of all let it come to a showdown with the Jews. Gehring admitted to making these statements, and he did not deny that in a letter dated July 31, 1941, shortly after the invasion of the Soviet Union, he had charged Reinhard Heydrich with the complete solution of the Jewish question in the German sphere of influence in Europe, some six months before Heydrich disclosed to high-ranking civil servants the meeting in a villa at Wannsee, Berlin, that the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe was to be the annihilation of the Jewish race. Initially, this was the responsibility of the Einsatzgruppe to follow the German armies as they advanced on the Eastern Front, driving Jews from their homes and taking them and other Nazi undesirables into the fields to be murdered. But as the war progressed, the Nazis found need for permanent installations to house, exploit for labor, and ultimately to murder these victims of Nazi insanity. Concentration camps already existed to imprison perceived enemies of the state. Now something more sinister was required. Extermination centers to eradicate the unwanted who had not been killed in the fields. The extermination centers were Treblinka, Sobibor, Maidenek, Chelmo, Belzec, and Auschwitz. We continue to find and develop evidence against the defendants as the case progressed. But by the time the prosecution had rested, we still had not found of the greatest killer of the regime, Rudolf Hirsch, the commandant of Auschwitz concentration camp. It was therefore a dramatic moment when I was informed that Hirsch had been captured by the British near Flensburg. I asked that he be sent to Nuremberg and interrogated him over a period of three days, reducing his testimony to an affidavit. I have most recently, in the last few years, I published this little book to the Jackson Center, Murdered by the Millions, which tells the story of this terrible thing. Hearst had joined the SS in September 1933 and was proposed by Heinrich Himmler for concentration camp duty at Dachau the following year. In 1939, he was assigned to Saxon House and in May 1940 was named to command a new quarantine camp to be built near the village of Oswiesen in Polish Silesia with a capacity of 10,000 prisoners. The German name of the new camp was Auschwitz. It was established at the site of a former Polish military barracks, and in the beginning most of the prisoners were Poles. In anticipation, of the coming war with the Soviet Union, Himmler instructed Hirsch in March 1941 to enlarge the basic Camp Auschwitz I to hold 30,000 prisoners, to construct a new camp 
at the nearby village of Birkenau to hold 100,000 prisoners. Auschwitz II and to supply 10,000 inmates for work at the E.K. Farman Synthetic Rubber Factory, Auschwitz III. In May 1941, Himmler called Hearst to Berlin, where he told him that in addition to the war against the Allied powers, Germany was engaged in a secondary struggle with the Jews. Hemmer said that if the Jews were not eliminated during the war, they in turn would destroy Germany. He told Hirsch that it was to be his war duty to establish extermination facilities at Auschwitz. Jews were to be sent there by Adolf Eichmann of the Gestapo, and it was to be Hirsch's responsibility to see that they were destroyed. Hearst confessed to me that approximately two and a half million persons had been murdered at Auschwitz. Upon completion of his testimony, he was turned over to the Polish government. While awaiting trial in Warsaw, Hearst recanted of this portion of his confession in part, stating that the figure he had given me had been supplied by Eichmann and that he regarded the total of two and a half million as far too high. Even Auschwitz had limits to its destructive possibilities, he wrote. I have recently written a book on this subject entitled A Murder by the Millions, published by the Robert H. Jackson Center, in which I observed that Hearst did not deny at any stage of interrogation or trial that Auschwitz was converted by him upon the orders of Heinrich Hemmer, a higher assistant police officer of the Third Reich, who took orders solely from Adolf Hitler, the Fuhrer of the Third Reich of Germany, from a concentration camp into an extermination center committed to murder of by the millions. This was Nazi genocide. Picture this tragedy of murder by the millions. A train pulls into the siding at Birkenau, the primary extermination facility at Auschwitz. An engine and 30 cattle cars jam the shoes. It is met by SS officers and guard dogs. The doors are opened and exhausted men, women, and children stumble out. They are told to leave their belongings behind. Able-bodied men and women without small children are directed to line up to the right. All others stand to the left to be taken directly as they are informed to the showers. When they arrive at the designated building and enter, they are told to remove their shoes and clothing, carefully hanging the ladder on number of the door to the communal shower room opens. Apprehensively, they enter, mothers holding their children's hands. For a moment, they are frightened, but are reassured when they observe the shower heads in the ceiling of the room and the men of the soda commando who accompany them. The latter soon leave, however, sealing the door behind them. Fear returns. In a moment, the shower heads activate. They reach out for the water, only to realize to their horror that gas is spewing out. They scream and try to rush to the barn door. Children cry out and fall to the ground to be trampled by their gasping mothers. After a few moments, the room is of a carved assembly of dead and dying victims. Faces distorted in pain, the eyes of little children frozen in fright. Screams of terror give way to the eerie silence of death. Soon all is quiet, and the men of the Sonar Commando open the door. 
They pull out the bodies and fetch them to the elevators which take them to the furnaces above, where gold rings are removed and gold teeth pulled out. Corpses are burned in the furnaces and ashes burned in the ground or dumped in the nearby street. This was not the crime of the Solomonians, who were themselves mostly Jewish and would take their turn in time in the gas chambers, but of Rudolf Hirsch alone, followed of the orders of Heinrich Himmler and the murderous policy of Adolf Hitler, but of 20th century men under whose rule of the world this incredible crime was committed. What was the number killed at Auschwitz? It matters not. Twas but a trifle in the history of the massacre of man by man. In his closing speech to the tribunal, Justice Jackson summarized the evidence supporting the guilt of the defendants, concluding with the following peroration. It is against such a background uh, that these defendants now ask this tribunal to say they are not guilty of planning, executing, or conspiring to commit this long list of crimes and wrongs. They stand before the record of this trial as bloodstained monsters stood by the body of his slain king. He begged of the widow, as they beg of you, say, I slew them not, and the queen replied, then say they were not slain, but dead they are. If you were to say of these men that they are not guilty, it would be as true to say that there has been no war, there has been no slain, there has been no crime, there has been no crime of genocide. On the first day of October 1946, the eight judges constituting the Nuremberg Tribunal took their seats at the bench facing the prisoner's dock, which was empty. Before it, the defense counsel occupied their chairs. To the left were the prosecution tables, occupied by the four allied prosecutors and the principal members of their staffs. I sat at the American table. Behind us, the visitor's gallery was packed with members of the press and visitors. The defendants were to be brought into the courtroom one at a time to hear the sentences pronounced against them. At 10 minutes before 3, the panel door in the back of the prison dock slid silently open. The defendant, Herman Garrett, stepped out of the elevator, which had brought him from the ground floor, where the other defendants waited. Garrett put on a set of headphones, which had been handed to him by one of the white helmeted American guards. The president of the tribunal began to speak. Gehring signaled that he was unable to hear through the headphone, and there was an awkward delay while the technician sought to correct the difficulty. A new set of headphones was produced, and once again, Gehring quietly awaited the words which were to decide his fate. Defendant Herman Wilhelm Gehring on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the International Military Tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. The number two Nazi turned on his heel and passed through the panel door into the waiting elevator. The door closed, and there was a hum of whispered voices in the courtroom as those present awaited the arrival of the next defendant, Hess. Rudolf Hess, who had flown his Messerschmitt to England in a futile effort to persuade the British to abandon the fight with Germany, was sentenced to imprisonment for life. The other defendants appeared in turn and received their sentences. Twelve, including Martin Bormann, who had been tried in absentia, and my defendant, Ernst Hoffenberg, received death sentences.
three were acquitted, and the remaining seven received varying terms of imprisonment. The tribunal declared as criminal organizations the leadership corps of the Nazi party, the SS, and my defendants, the Gestapo, and the SD. Appeals were taken by all of the defendants in the Allied Control Council to the Allied Control Council, except Alton. The appeals were uniformly denied at a meeting of the council on October 10. I had been designated uh, by Justice Jackson as his personal representative at the executions and was the only prosecutor present in the Palace of Justice on the fateful night of October 15, 16, of 1946. Shortly before midnight, the electrifying word was released that Garrett had cheated the hangman by taking poison while lying ostensibly asleep upon the bed in his cell. Death thus came to Garrett by his own hand as it had come to Hepner, Hemner, and Burroughs before him. Even as the prison officer was walking to the cell block to give formal notice of the executions to take place that night. At 11 minutes past one o'clock in the morning of October 16, the white-faced former foreign minister Joaquin von Ribbentrop stepped through the door into the execution chamber and faced the gallery on which he and the others condemned to die by the tribunal were to be hanged. His hands were unmanacled and bound behind him with a leather thong. Ribbentrop walked to the foot of the 13 steps leading to the gallows platform. He was asked to state his name and answer, Joaquin von Ribbentrop. Flanked by two guards and followed by the chaplain, he slowly mounted the stairs. On the platform he saw the hangman.